I read you this because I feel like this $3 worth of Jesus, let's just be honest. We live in a great time, in a great world, in a great country with a lot that can, it's a lot of luxuries, a lot of comforts, and we throw our Jesus in on the side just to make sure we're good when, it all, when the time, the clock runs out. And this $3 worth of Jesus it's, it's telling because you're going to need a lot more than him in order not to let this panic change you. Either you're going to be rooted in your Jesus or you're going to be rooted in the fear of this world and one or the other they will change you. But this $3 worth of Jesus, you know, just enough like a cup of warm milk or a snooze in the sunshine. This is not how you want to be approaching your God right now. It's in moments like this, it's, it's in these moments of affliction, guys, that you really should exercise your faith as hard as you can. This is a valuable time for you. It really is. A lot of people like to escape pain and escape fear. And I'm telling, don't, don't run from it. Run to it. Because the love of God, your father, is going to be known in the midst of your trial. It's coming after you. I mean, there's nothing you can do about it. You're going to go to Walmart, and you're going to see the empty shelves, and it's going to remind you about what is really happening in this world, the unrooted fear of how... Guys, I don't have to say much more than go on Facebook and read the memes of how toilet paper does not... has nothing to do with what's going on, but everybody's afraid of the quarantine and being afraid of being stuck in a room and not being able to take care of themselves. And there's some legitimacy to that. Right? They're, they're, that's, that's some people's reality right now. It, I mean, so we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We need, we need to understand what is real. But we need to understand also the workings of fear. So I was driving in this morning, and we were going to go to Hebrews 6, and like I said, we'll touch on it, but I just... I've got this, like, in my mind, it's like, your God, which is my God, your God is incredibly powerful. He's incredibly huge. You can't begin to fathom how big, how powerful, how mighty your God is. Like, guys, you don't even, you can't even begin to glimpse his glory you can't even begin to understand his significance and then flip this around. And if you begin to understand that he is what is alive in you, then you begin to see not just how big he is, how big you are. Not just how mighty he is, but how mighty you are. And I'll tell you something, God does not fear. God does not fear at all. Not a moment and not a second in history that your God became a little nervous, that your God became a little fearful. It's never happened in his world. It doesn't work like that with God. So therefore, it shouldn't happen with us. But it does. It does, because we live in a fallen world. And I'll just I'll touch on this a little bit. I was out mulching, so I run a business and part of my business is a, it's, it's called forestry mulching. 
So I'm in a machine that has a, it's got a head on the front of it. Think of a stump grinder. Have you ever seen a stump grinder? Maybe like on steroids. It's got, it's got a bunch of teeth on it. It's just, des it's designed to, to chop up trees. And so I'm out in these woods and I'm chopping up some trees. I do this typically like before a builder is going to build a house. They want to see uh, what good trees are on the property. I go in and I'll take out all the bad trees and, and the sick trees and the invasives. And I'm in this lot and there's this mud hole in the middle of the lot. It's a two acre lot, just a random mud hole in the lot. And I, it appears there's a tire in the lot, in, in this mud hole. And I'm mulching for about an hour around this mud hole. And this I, honestly, God, probably an eight-foot mother gator lurches out of this mud hole at, at my mulching machine. The dumbest thing to ever do. I am here shredding trees, and this gator comes out and wants to attack the machine. And I'm, I'm just thought myself, fearless, incredibly fearless. And then you see the babies come out of the mud hole, and this, this mom would have stopped at nothing to protect those babies. I could not scare her away. I'm in my machine and behind bulletproof glass. I'll be honest, my heart, is this thing going to eat me? I mean, will it eat my machine? Then I mean, all the fear started setting in. And then the guy side steps in. I'm like, I want to get out, see how close I can get to the thing before it chases me. And um, it was just like, what, what's going on in that gator mind? It's just, there's no fear. There's no, there's a, there's a instinctive need to protect her babies. This love that is driving this gator to say, you know, I'm not stopping at anything. Typically, they would run from humans. We'll take on a huge machine that is clearly destroying the habitat right around it. There's, there's no fear in this gator. And here we are. The fear isn't about the virus. I honestly, it's not truly about the virus. It's about running out of stuff like toilet paper. I really believe that the fear is not rooted in the virus. It's root and guys, and I, I love it because we can actually now talk about the absurdity of the fear. We can actually begin to address this and not, not have to walk on eggshells. All right? I mean, we get it. The virus, I mean, much like the flu, the flu is a virus and whatnot. It can be deadly. It can be harmful. And that's the reality of some people. So we don't want to dismiss that. But what is going on inside of the, the people of this world and possibly inside of you? What is at the core of fear? So you're an heir to the promise. Um, I, you know, I don't know. man. Maybe I'll have some importance this morning. You know the word patience, though. We looked at it last week. Patience at its core means to long suffer. Long suffering. Which is just, I want those words to sink in for a moment. To be patient, you have to endure. Something hard. Some sort of affliction. At its very shallowest sense, if you're waiting on someone to show up, you're enduring their, their hardiness. You're enduring the fact that they aren't being true to their word and which what time they said that they're going to show up. Now, if you are living through the flu or this COVID-19, you're enduring, you're patiently waiting for it to end. But as a child of God, your life has, you have no choice but to be patient. There's no escape. You'll have your good days and the sun will shine, but your outer self is wasting away. There's no escaping the corruption that has set in into your flesh. Your life, your life is marred by suffering. And to some extent, some of you, you know this, you know this very well. Suffering. was the last chapter of your life. Maybe it's the current page of your testimony. For some of you, you just cannot escape. You don't know what to do. You don't, where do you go? How do you, how, how do you patiently wait through this? How do you hold on to the hope that God gives us in Scripture? 
How do you believe in the promises of God? That he will prosper you. He will make you well. He will heal you. By his stripes, you are healed. I mean, how do you hold on to these promises? And yet, you look in the mirror every day. See the age. It's your reality. It's my reality. And I, I get it. See, Abraham, we, Abraham's journey. Uh, put me on the next slide. Just want to really quickly recap. Abraham, everyone here know who Abraham was? Abraham, you've heard of Abraham and how God called him to move out of his homeland and to go to a, a promised land that his descendants would, would be given. And he ends up in Egypt. The star is the promised land. He actually went through the promised land because there was a famine there. There was no food to be found. And he, so he went to Egypt. And in Egypt, there was a lot of fear. He's like, hey, you know, he told his wife, lie. Let's pretend you're my sister so they don't kill me. Fear set in. And so he started manipulating his, his reality in order to solve a bunch of what ifs. What if they kill me? What if this happens? What if that happens? Therefore, let's do X, Y, and Z. And what does he ultimately do? He goes back to the land of suffering. He ends up back in the famine. And he prefers, he learned that it was better to be in a land of suffering where he knew God than a land of abundance where he took control. But that fear, it did, it did something to him. Hebrews 6, so we desire each one of you to show, we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end. Hope. How do you get hope? How do you obtain hope? A hope that never ends. Uh, you need faith and you need patience. You need both. You need faith. You need to trust your promise maker. And then you need to wait. Hope is always about something better than the current circumstance. Hope is always about a future that is more glorious than the present. Hope is always about, you see, the moment you start picturing your future as being worse than today, well, hope turns into fear. You see, hope is always about aiming for something greater. That you may not be sluggish. Be imitators of those who through faith and patience, they inherited the promises. They, they received their hope through faith and patience. I want, I, want, I want us to look at this idea of fear real quick. What, what is fear? What generates fear? Just think about this for a moment. Fear is not about the present. Fear is never about your very, the moment you're in right now. Fear is always about what if this happens? What if that happens? Fear is about the unknown Certainty of the future. How do, you, how, how do I paint this out? You have toilet paper now, but what if you were to run out? So we should run to the store and get some, and there is none. But your current, your current circumstance, you've already solved that problem. The problem solved. But fear is about imagining a future that could happen that is worse than the moment you're in right now. Let's take something that, that seems a little bit more like immediate. You're in a house and it's being broken into. And fear overcomes you. But in that moment in which it's being broken into, you still have breath. You still have hope. You still may escape this without injury. But fear sets in and says, well, what if he gets to me? What if he, the, the, what if he takes everything I have? What if he harms me and my family? Fear, fear looks at the future and plays out worst case.
case scenario in the mind. But it's a very powerful emotion. Because what does it do? When you live in fear, you put your body through all of those emotions as if you are actually living out that fear. If you fear getting the virus, panic can set in, stress can set in, and the body begins to operate in a manner as if it has the virus. So fear actually begins to usher us. The heart rate picks up. The blood pressure picks up. The mind becomes full of anxiety. Possibly if you live in the fear long enough, depression. And your body actually lives through everything it's imagining that it might live through. You're taking yourself through the emotions before the reality ever sets in, before the, you ever even hit the future. And so fear is very powerful because not only does it imagine worst case scenario, but it actually brings you into an emotional state in which you are experiencing the worst case scenario. And so if worst case scenario actually happens, you now have to live it twice. Fear is fed by doubt. You do not know what the future holds. And so you're left to the imagination. Your fear is led, it's, it's fed by what ifs. What if this happened and what if that happens? Fear is fed with, without having answers. So fear thrives on uncertainty. But what does faith do? Faith places confidence in a God who controls the future. Faith says, you know, God is in control. Therefore, I don't have to worry. I will be taken care of. Regardless, worst case, best case scenario, my God is in control, so I'm okay. It's so faith and fear, they, don't, they can't mix. Like oil and water, they don't go together at all. They just cannot coexist. Because faith is the presence of confidence in the future based upon a God who is in control. And fear is based upon what ifs and uncertainty that is, that is uh, fed by not knowing who is in control and what will happen. So doubt and fear go hand in hand. But faith and patience go hand in hand. And so here you have two at play. And let's just talk about toilet paper real quick one more time. I mean, so the world is being driven in panic. Economies are crashing. And the, uh, the epicenter of this is a lack of toilet paper for a flu-like symptom. What has taken place? The uncertainty of the future, the imagination has ran wild with fear. And so people aiming to take control. Now look, hold on. Now I'm not saying don't go buy toilet paper if you see it on a shelf. But what we're analyzing here is how is fear working? You don't know what tomorrow holds. You can't know what tomorrow holds. So what are you going to do with that uncertainty? You can feel it in, fill, feel it, fill in the blanks with a bunch of what ifs. Worst case scenario happens, and then you could walk through all the hard times before the hard times ever really hit in. Or you could say, you know, I got a God. And if he wants to call me home, so be it. I'll be in a much better place. But to get, I mean, that's a huge uh, spectrum there. To get to that point where even death is not a scary thing, you've got to walk through a lot of suffering. You've got to come to a point realizing what this life is really all about. And you may not be there, and, that, and that's okay. But ultimately, the goal of your faith is, is you're going to be home with your Heavenly Father where there will be no more fear. No more need of imagination. You'll know exactly what will take place because your father's in full control. So God made a promise to Abraham 
He had no one greater by whom to swear. He swore by himself. It's easy to, I think, get lost with these promises and adhere to the promises of God. You know what he's saying here? Let me, let me read the rest of it real quick. Because he says, he says, surely I will bless you and multiply you. That's a great promise. man. I mean, if God says, I'm going to bless you and multiply you, I mean, I'm going to live. I, I, that would be great to hear from God. Just, hey, God, just multiply the toilet paper right now. That's all I need, right? Let's, just, let's, let's lower the bar and multiply toilet paper. And thus Abraham, having patiently awaited, obtained the promise. And now here it is. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So is he teaching us how to give oaths or something? I don't. So when God desired to show more convincingly, when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. That's what God desired to do with Abraham. He wanted Abraham to know, I don't change. My character does not change ever. So he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. What is he saying? The promise is a great thing, but this isn't about the promise. It's about the promise maker. It's so easy to get distracted by the promise that you forget about the person who made the promise. He's saying to Abraham and, and to you, we who have fled for refuge, that's you. You're trying to find the home. That you might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before you. So you can't just lock on to the promise. You need to know the promise maker. He's unchangeable. He doesn't lie. His character never changes. So what he says will happen. What he says, but it doesn't fill in all the blanks of life. And hence the room for fear to sneak in. Hence the room for faith to be exercised during your times of suffering. But he's saying to Abraham, and he's saying it to you. It's about the promise maker. Know me. Know my character. No, I will not lie to you. But I won't do that. God says to Abraham, I don't lie. I can't lie. It's, it's, it's ironic. It's not that he just doesn't lie. Like he resists the urge to lie. He simply cannot. God simply cannot lie. It, it is impossible for God to lie. I mean, it says it right there. I'm just adding some emphasis. It is impossible for, to, for him to lie. As impossible, it, 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 just like you can't fly. You can't go jump off a cliff and flap your arms and pretend you're a bird and fly. You can't do that. God cannot lie. I want, I want to change tones here for a moment. So as I was driving in this morning, and the, these stories kept popping in my head, and this is, Guys, you got a great God. There is nothing to fear. There's nothing to fear. The what ifs of tomorrow, they're already filled in by the God who's in control. He's already written the book, the storybook of your life in the world. I mean, all the days are numbered, the days of the earth are numbered. It's it's all it's all taken care of. You're fleeing for refuge. Your encouragement needs to be be set in God. Uh, so hold on. So this is in this story. I'm gonna read. I want to read to you a couple stories from the Old Testament. I just find fascinating. So Elisha was a prophet, and the king of Syria hated the guy. Elisha had a servant with him, a young guy with him, and the king of Syria says, "You know, finally he just got so mad they couldn't beat Israel at some war. He says, go get Elisha and let's just kill the guy." So Syria sends, the king of Syria sends out a huge army to go capture Elisha. And the servant of Elisha begins to freak out. They're coming, they're coming, oh, we're going to die. And, and 
What is it? The servant of God. Behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? There is no more toilet paper. <laughs> Just it. I'm sorry. I've had the best week on Facebook, man. I have spent so many nights just cracking up laughing. It's so, it's hilarious. I mean, and uh, he said, <laughs> he said, do not be afraid. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And what does he do? God opened his eyes. Let him see that the mountains are on fire with the angels in the and God does. And the servant looks out and he sees a greater army than the army of the world standing around ready to protect. And the servant got to see what was actually real. What wasn't real was what was going on in his mind. He was living out the what is. We are doomed. We are doomed. That wasn't real. That was based upon a bunch of what ifs that let fed his fear. And Elisha says, you need to see what is actually your reality. God is in control, not the king of Syria. You know what Elisha ends up doing? He walks up to the army. He says, God, hey, blind them for a moment. God blinds them. This is, it's incredible, some of these stories. God blinds the entire army. And Elisha takes them by the hand, walks them over to Samaria, and says, God, now open their eyes. And they're in the middle of Samaria. And Elisha goes, hey, the guy you're looking for, which was him, goes, he's in there. And he walks away. And then the king of Samaria goes, well, you, you just brought the enemy over. And, well, should we kill him? And Elisha goes, no, feed him some sandwiches. Honest to God, this is how the story, feed him. And they, in love, they fed him. You know what the king of Syria did? Uh, we don't need to attack those guys anymore. He walked away. It's incredible. Your imagination can never fill in that blank. But your fear could fill in the blanks of, oh, we're doomed, we're doomed. And yet God steps in in this situation and says, oh, look, man, it was all under control. Elijah knew it. He had no fear. The servant, he didn't see what Elisha saw. He eventually saw it. He calmed down. He placed his faith back in God. So then, you know, a little bit later, the, uh, the Syrians, this is actually one chapter later, 2 Kings chapter 7, there's a famine going on in the land. The Syrians decide, yeah, let's attack these guys again. Then there's no food. There's no food to be had in all of Israel. And Elisha says something to the king of, of Samaria. He says, look, man, don't freak out. Tomorrow the bread is going to be like buy one, get 12 free. It's going to be such a great deal. The king's mirror is like, what do you, I don't know what you're talking about. And Elisha says, you just got to stop fearing. God's in control. Tomorrow, you'll have more food than you know what to do with. The king of Syria is knocking on their doorstep again and wants to wipe them out. Let me read to you a little bit from this. For the Lord had made the army, for the Lord had made the army of the Syrians hear the sound of chariots, chariots and of horses, the sound of a great army. The Lord made the enemies hear something that wasn't real. He caused fear to stir up and like Humans, the what ifs took off. The imagination took off. They said to one another, Behold, the king of Israel has hired against us the king of the Hittites and the king of Egypt to come against us. What is he talking about? That's not what's happened. His fear, their fear has taken over. They're living in their fake reality. They're living in their imagination. And now they are the enemies of God are in chaos. So they fled away in twilight and abandoned their tents. They run away, and God used fear and the imagination of man to drive his enemies away. And these four lepers, the next morning, wake up and goes, you know, we're going to die of starvation. Let's just go over to the Syrian camp and like, just say, hey, either kill us or give us something to eat. That's what, they, that's what they do, and they walk over and like, holy smokes, they're all gone, and they left their fridges plugged in, and, and they walk over and they open, and it's, there's food. The next fridge, there's food. And these lepers are like, they pack in their bags full of food. And they're like, man, we should probably share this with like our fellow Jews. And so they go over and goes, there's a lot of food right over the mountain. And sure enough, bread was buy one, get 12 free. Elisha was right again. There was no fear. Elisha's faith in God led him. And he was able to see the future would hold. Remember Gideon. Remember, I mean, remember his story. He he was his name means mighty warrior. 
And he was like, God, I don't know if we can do this. You know, could you like make that fleece like wet in the morning and the ground dry? And sure enough, it happens. Like, God, you really want me to go attack those, uh, what is it, the Moabites or something? I, maybe that was an accident. Can you make the fleece dry and the ground wet? And God's like, sure, man, because I get it, man. People doubt. Let's just do it again. Well, you know, eventually he's down to 300 people, men, to go fight this war. And when they blew the 300 trumpets, we're Judges 7. The Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army. The army fled as far as Bethsheda towards Zirara, as far as the border of Abemel. Abel, I did not read this in advance. I should have. It would have helped. Abel Mehola by ta Either way, I mean, it worked. The, uh, they run away. What are they? There's, there's, like, there's thousands and thousands of these men ready to whop off the heads of the, uh, of the Israelites. And Gideon's you know, like, all right, let's break the jars and shine the flashlights at them. And, and fear overtakes them. And they, they, they run away. You see, this is, this is what I'm trying to drive at. Fear is based upon a lie, a, uh, a fake future reality. It's never based upon the moment. I, I brought that up because, guys, you're okay right now. You're okay right now. You're not fearing your moment. If you fear, you're, you're fearing something in the future because you don't know if you will be okay. I guarantee you when that moment comes, you're still going to be okay. You will still be taken care of. And, well, in that moment, what are you going to do? Praise God. Let's exercise your faith. Oh, it was okay. So I should really trust in the Lord. I really should begin to understand he loves me. That the promise maker, he is a good father. And... Let's go worst case scenario. COVID-19 settles in your lungs. You're breathing your last breath. Did your father let you down? Did your God fail you? You say that pretty confidently, and I'm curious as to why you say no. Some of you, you say no. I'll, I'll fill in the blank. Some of you, you say no because you've been there. And it You've come to realize it's not about taking another breath here. It's about what's right after that last breath. He will not fail me. This is where Abraham got. He got to the point of realizing the promise isn't about today. It's not about this earth. It's not about my home. This is why he went back to the land that had the, the famine, the suffering. He came to realize to his last breath, what God promised me was a world and a life far beyond what the eyes can see. And so he preferred to suffer in faith than live in fear in the abundance of toilet paper. You're going to come to that point and see that last square block on your roll. And, and you'll have a live illustration of this sermon. Will you trust? <laughs> and I guarantee you, you will be okay. I'm missing a sock this morning. I got one more. I got, uh, I got one more. This, one, this one's really good, man. I really, I, I really appreciate the worship team. Um, something you can't experience watching online. If you're watching online right now, you guys are part of the family too. But we get the blessing of singing. You could sing at home, it's weird. But here you can blare it out and we just turn up the volume a little bit more and we drown out your voice. <laughs> the singing does something for the soul. I want to read you one more story. Second Chronicles chapter 20. This is this is amazing. Um I'm going to read just bits and pieces of it. So this is Jehoshaphat's prayer. The Moabites and the Ammonites and some Munites, they came against Jehoshaphat for battle. So he's a king of Israel. Jehoshaphat 
stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our Father, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nation. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand. Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? He's not asking because he's wondering. He's asking because he's reminding himself a little bit like, God, just let's not forget what's actually happened. Are you not God that gave up your one and only son to die on a cross because you saw that I was that precious? Are you not the God who sent your son to walk on a corrupt earth for 32 years and in obedience even to the point of death, he suffered right alongside of us? Are you not the God who, after the days of Noah, made a promise to Noah that not due to corruption you'll ever wipe out this earth with water? Hey, are you not the God who did promise Abraham and the heirs the promises of life, the blessings of abundance? Are you not that God? If disaster comes upon us, the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine we will stand before this house and before you. Your name, God, is in this house and cry out to you in our affliction and you will hear and save. That's his prayer to God. You will hear and you will save. Jehoshaphat says to God, your name is in this house. Therefore, when, I when we cry out to you, you're going to hear us and you're going to save us. He's not telling them. He's telling himself what his God will do. Your God is in the house of your hearts. He prepared a room for himself and his son and his spirit to live in you. When you cry out to your God, the mighty God over all the universe, who's not nervous about this virus, when you cry out to him, will he not come to save you? Will he not come and hear your cries? Will he not come to your rescue? We are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you, Jehoshaphat says. It sounds like a prayer that would be uttered even this day. We don't know what to do, God. We're going to buy toilet paper. You take care of the rest. Oh, there is no toilet. We truly don't know what to do. We are powerless against this, God. There's nothing you can do that will fix that stock market. There's nothing you will do that will change the voice of the media and, and at, to ask them to usher in some words of calmness and peace. There's nothing you can do except to cry out to God. And then Judah, or Jehoshaphat says to Judah, listen all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid. Why? Why? Because fear based upon a bunch of lies, a bunch of fake, or a bunch of what ifs that are filled in with our corrupt imagination. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours, it is God's. Tomorrow, go down against them. In other words, Hey, resume back to life tomorrow, right? You've got a battle, then let's fight it. You need some toilet paper, then go try and buy it. You need to go get some food, go and get it. It's not your battle though. Tomorrow, go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz. You will find them at the end of the valley, east of the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle, but you do need to show up. You will not need to fight in this battle, but you need to show up. Stand firm. Hold your position. But you don't need to fight. You're going to straight to the front line. Hey, the world needs people like you right now who are not afraid to stand on the front line and declare, you know, I don't even need to fight this, but I'll stand here to prove to you my God saves. 
Stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them. The Lord will be with you. And that's a promise you can take to the bank. Then Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. That's how they responded. Let's worship. The Levites, the Kohathites, and the Korhites stood up to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. So the battle's right out around the corner, and they decide, let's stand and praise. They rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa, went out to face the battle. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me. Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God. Have faith and you will be established. Believe his prophets. Believe his word. Believe everything you have heard. You will succeed. And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were... To... <laughs> this, this cracks me up. So he took counsel with the people and he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in his holy attire as they went before the army and say, give thanks to the Lord for steadfast love endures forever. And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah so that they were routed. What did they do? They sang their worries away. They walk up to the enemy and I bust it out. Just like pull out the, the, the little guitar and let's just start. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if there's any better picture of what we should do. Just sing. It's all okay. Because our God is huge. He had the ambush already set up, waiting to go. For the men of Ammon and Moab rose against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, devoting them to destruction. When they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they all helped to destroy one another. So Israel's singing, the ambush is in place, so these enemies of Moab take out Moab, and then it says, and just to make sure everything was good, all those enemies, the Moabites, Ammonites, and Munites, Anyone that was left, they started fighting each other until there was no one left. And Israel's just singing. And the enemies are destroying themselves. That's fine. Let them destroy themselves. We don't need to participate in the battle because it belongs to God. But you know what those enemies need to see? They need to see anchors like yourself who are holding tight who are proclaiming from the rooftops, from the mountaintops, from the beaches, God is good. He's got this. We're okay. In fact, to prove it, I can have my toilet paper. And that's a big statement. I guarantee you, you give someone your toilet paper, they will wonder what is wrong with this guy. And you could tell them, you know, son, my God <laughs> I th th uh, thank God it's toilet paper in, in a situation that doesn't require toilet paper because we can laugh at it and we can really talk about some great things. Because if it's really serious, it may be a different story right now, but the, pr the principles are all the same. Fear is fed by a bunch of lies, a bunch of what ifs. Sam, we should probably start singing here in a second. In the meantime, in the meantime, sing. And no, in all honesty, let your heart sing out to the Lord. Give him thanks because you're okay. Go, uh, go ahead, Helen. Psalm 91. You got, you got some cliff notes to it?
He shall give his angels charge over Thank you, Helen. You know, in the vacuum where, where hope is removed, the only thing to take its place is depression. Why so downcast, oh my soul? Put your hope in God. He will come. He will save you. He will rescue you. He is your God yesterday, today, and forever. Heavenly Father, 